adventure education. Uh, they have a, around 950 members working in adventure education field in the school of University of New Hampshire. And uh, today he is going to uh, talking about adventure programming and something uh, he has done in the United States for adventure therapy and adventure programming. Then if maybe we can take some time in the afternoon, they have a Q&A, so they can keep asking about the professional field, about the question. Yes. Is it okay? In the afternoon, yes. probably one, two hours. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's put our hand and welcome. So the big question is, how much time do we have before lunch? <laughs> we can jump o'clock, 12 o'clock, yeah. and, and okay. then if you're hungry, then have a lunch. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's very exciting to be here. This is my first trip to Taiwan. I've been in Singapore seven times before this, working on various projects with corporate adventure training and adventure therapy, working with Singapore programs. I spent the month of February in Shanghai, and that was much colder, much rainier. It was nice to come to sunny Taipei. Today, as compared to Shanghai, is a very sunny day, <laughs> in my opinion, so this is a good day. Yesterday was beautiful, so any sunny day we can get is great. I'm here with my daughter. She is right now on a Taiwan Hour Bomb School program, actually on day two, the river trekking today. So that's a, river trekking is actually found very old, much only in Taiwan and Japan. Most other programs you wouldn't find river trekking, so this is a very exciting day for my family would be on a new type of adventure that we wouldn't get to be in, in um, the United States. Um, I brought more stuff, more things that we could ever talk about in two full days. So my hope is, is that we are able, I'm able to share with you some concepts and some theories and some actual case studies with clients that I've worked with um, on doing that. But it's very important to me that um, I answer your questions more so than I just tell you things about me. I like to talk about things that I do and clients I've worked with in the past. So I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. You can start to sleep and sleep. And, sleep. and that would really work out so well. So my hope is, is that if you ever have any types of questions or you don't understand something, because my, Ch my English is very good, but my Chinese is much worse than your English is. So one of the agreements Professor you know, Chi said to me is that I can just speak in English and you all will totally understand me, right? <laughs> that is the case. But if that is not the case, then I want you to stop me and have me explain it. And then we may lean on uh, you know, Professor and uh, you know, De Shin to help me translate here. So. Amanda, of course, and Nina can translate, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Nina did a great job getting us here. I was I look at the Taiwan traffic and I'm always that's an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Nina made it just so easy, so smooth. I was very we were very blessed to have her and the man that come with us and help us out together. So thank you. <laughs> so uh, I have a lot of past to talk about. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my past and kind of how I got to where I am right now share some stories of things that worked and didn't work for me, share perspectives about um, what is happening right now in the world and different perspectives. I've been lucky enough to pretty much do adventure therapy on almost every continent but Antarctica. I haven't really figured out how to do adventure therapy with penguins yet. So um, we shall see how I'm going to do it. But I'd like, I, I'm willing to share stories about that and differences on how cultures have on adventure therapy, how they're different out there. And then also talk about the future, because I think um, you and Taiwan are actually very lucky, because adventure therapy and adventure programming really hasn't really reached its level that it possibly could be as its potential. In countries like mine in America and Great Britain, adventure is no longer a big deal as far as a new innovative thing. People will say, oh, adventure, that's been around for 40 or 50 years, and it has been. So in Taiwan, it's relatively new, and there's a lot to be determined in Taiwan about what the future of adventure therapy, corporate adventure training, and adventure education in schools can really truly be. And that's really up to you to create your own destiny. And I can kind of 
from my perspective and looking around the world, made some predictions for you about what might happen in Taiwan and how you might want to be ready for it as kind of the emerging professionals here in Taiwan. Um, you are, you, uh, this is, I get, I get a lot of letters after my name. That just doesn't mean a whole lot. That just kind of defines who are. Just so you know a little bit about my background, besides like uh, Professor Chimu and myself being professors in kind of adventure things, I'm also a marriage and family therapist. So I work with youth and their families and a lot of times couples that are in dysfunction. So you're going to hear a lot of my presentations. Christine was here last year, right? Christine, yeah, Martin, they heard a lot of her. So the differences between Christine and I is that Christine probably spoke a lot of, about youth at youth at risk, talking about the individual. And you may hear my presentation be more about the youth at risk in the context of the family, because I work in a much more systemic type of way with the youth that I work with in kind of the concept there. So that's going to be there. You're free to use any of this stuff, just as you know, a professor has taught you that if you make sure you reference it, because it would be appropriate for all good students to reference their material out there. That's important to do. But you are free to use this. In fact, that would be a great honor if you end up using some of my thoughts. That would be an honor there. These are some of the books that are going to be coming. Um, I have been lucky enough to have been brought here and sponsored by Taiwan Out of Bomb School. And I actually live right now in As 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 Fire Park and Long Tan yes. on there. On there, and then these are some books that you may have seen before that are going to be helped in the translation process to be brought forward. The Essential Elements of Facilitation. I first, the second edition came out in 2003. Reflective Learning came out in 1999, and then the one that really can put you to sleep is the Effective Leadership and Adventure Program, and that was last published in 2005. So if you need a good sedative, because you can't sleep at night, this is the one you choose. Because it's so long. No one can read it in one city and you'll go right to sleep. So it's a good site for you. And uh, we're working right now on getting those translated into Chinese. How many people know where New Hampshire is? Geography lessons. Of course, he knows where New Hampshire is. <laughs> New Hampshire is the size of Taiwan. So if you just take Taiwan, you move it north a lot. <laughs> and you move it east 12 hours on there. So right now, it's... 9.30 at night for me. So I'll be good for about three hours, but then right when it's noon for you, it'll be midnight for me, and I might be falling asleep. <laughs> so you have to wake me up. And uh, we live, instead of living on the Atlantic Ocean, we live on, or the Pacific Ocean, we live on the Atlantic Ocean. It's much colder on there. When we go sea kayaking, we have to wear wetsuits, if not dry suits, to make sure we don't get hypothermia there. And it took me about 24 hours of living in a long silver tube to get here on there. But I flew from, flew to Washington, D.C., then to uh, Tokyo, and then to here on there. Um, it's much colder than Taipei. It, I heard it snowed 10 centimeters on uh, Jade Mountain a couple of days ago, which was real exciting for everybody at the time on our bound school. And I said, you know, isn't 10 centimeters about like this much? <laughs> we don't even count that in New Hampshire. It's got to snow like this much. <laughs> so last, a week ago last Monday, it snowed 15 inches, which is this much in New Hampshire in one day. So that's snow in New Hampshire. So we're, we're definitely in a more of a winter climate there. So this for us is a warm, sunny, beautiful day for us. <laughs> I've been there 28 years. It's a long time. So my job is to teach and do research and, and kind of run and organize programs. And we have an undergraduate, a master's program. And our people who are getting adventure therapy at the master's level have a degree in adventure programming and then a degree in social work. So we have combined those two together. So when they graduate, they actually have two masters, one in adventure programming for therapeutic applications and then one as a traditional social worker. So that's kind of the way that we kind of approach adventure therapy right now. And that will take a student somewhere between two to four years, depending upon how confident they are when they come in. How many credit hours did you take? Go ahead. How many credit hours did you take? Um, about 90. They would take about 90 for the whole two programs together. And then if you, yeah. They certainly did half of that. <laughs> She's looking at me going, how did you do that? That would be impossible.
Nation was actually at the University of New Hampshire for three years. So I really can't get away with a whole lot of stories here because she really knows what I do there. So I got I to stay honest. <laughs> the truth. Um, we have an undergraduate degree, master's degrees, and then we have doctoral degrees. And there are realistically three universities you go to in the United States for adventure programming. One is Indiana University. Yes. As you can kind of see, we are advertising today. <laughs> and then one is the University of New Hampshire, and then one is with Jim Sidthorpe, a good friend of Utah. Yeah, in Utah. In there used to be one at the University of Minnesota, but they closed that program down. So those are really the three places you go to get your doctoral degrees, and so we have doctoral students and so forth there. But uh, uh, New Hampshire is a uh, nation. How would you describe New Hampshire? Oh, she's not listening to anyone. She's learned to ignore me already. Um, how would you describe New Hampshire? Cold. 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 Besides cold. Beautiful. Beautiful. The polish. Yeah. It is, the, of all the 50 states in the United States, it has the most forested per acre. So 90% of the state is forest. So you can't see very far without getting trees in the way. <laughs> so to see far distances, we have to go to the ocean to see. So it's very heavily forested, a lot of mountains there. Um, kind of a couple of definitions. I've shared this with some of them before, but my students in New Hampshire wanted me to share this with you. Um, the definition of a professor to my students is, is a person that keeps talking long after people stop listening. So I, can, I might keep talking. You might stop listening a long time ago, but I'll keep talking. And one of the few people that do that. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully we'll have some dialogue and we'll work that out. And uh, Americans, um, I learned this from my Singaporean friends. Uh, they said, well, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. And in Singapore, most people speak about five languages, but three languages is pretty good. If you speak two languages in Singapore, uh, you can probably get by. You know, two languages. And if you speak one language in Singapore, it's obvious you must be an American. <laughs> because only Americans speak just English. And unfortunately, that's true. I speak Spanish, but that doesn't help us in Taiwan. <laughs> so, we can do this. So, um, I apologize for not knowing Chinese. I'm learning something every day on there, so um, ni hao. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll work with my limitations as much as possible and we'll try to get better on that. All right, I want to talk to you about my first job I had. My first job was as a teacher. And as a teacher, what I did is that I was hired to teach, um, I majored in three things in an undergraduate degree. I had three undergraduate majors. One was in physical education, one was in health studies or health sciences, and one was in psychology. So those were the three that I wanted. So I was basically hired by a high school to go and teach physical education, but then also health education, human sexuality, health sciences, that type of thing. But in the school that I taught in Rosemont, Minnesota, which is really cold. If you thought New Hampshire was cold, Minnesota is really cold. <laughs> Almost as cold, but like Indiana. Very cold. It's cold in Indiana. Cold, very cold. You don't want to go there in the winter. So what happened was is that it was a brand new school and they and it was the very first climbing wall ever built in the state of Minnesota was in this high school. And they didn't have anyone that could teach on it though. But they had heard that I had learned how to rock climb and they said, Would you like to teach on this? So I said, sure. So I had my choice of things to teach. So for physical education, rather than teaching badminton, basketball, volleyball, I taught indoor rock climbing, cross-country skiing. We actually had a downhill ski area that was like 20 minutes away on their orienteering. Volleyball and human sexuality. That was my teaching load of all those. I don't know how you put all of those together, but that was my job. And I thought that I had died and gone to heaven. Because realistically, that's what, for me, was the purpose of educating through the physical. And it was the purpose of doing that is that my job wasn't there on that rock wall to teach people to be better rock climbers. My job on that rock wall was to use rock climbing to teach people to be better people. So there's a critical difference in there that you can see in my philosophy about what I do. Even though I've been rock climbing for now more years than I want to admit, more, more years than anyone probably in this room except for professor has been born. 
my role with rock climbing wasn't so much to teach people to go and be better rock climbers, although that was important to me. My role was to use the medium of rock climbing to use psychology and health sciences to make people better people. And, then, and I started like kind of seeing the world this way, and I ended up finding out through professionally that I wasn't the only one there. In fact, uh, one of professors, uh, professors in Indiana, Alan Ebert and I, met in 1979. Once again, before all of you were born <laughs> on there. That was the first time. And we were teaching rock climbing together. And Professor Ebert very much was, uh, very, he came out of the military. So he was rock climbing. He even wore green army fatigues when he rock climbed. And I would wear like very much hippie yes, like. Yes, it was Professor. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, there you go. Advisor. You probably you probably know Dr. Ewer. You see him wearing green fatigues, rock climbing. And I was wearing like a bandana and painter pants and things like that. But the idea was is that as we started to get together and talk about professionals in the late 70s, we started to see that well you had different philosophies, but there was a kind of a greater goal than just teaching rock climbing and what we did. And it stems back to a story to Josh Miner. Does anyone know who Josh, this would be like great history questions. Does anyone know who Josh Miner is? <laughs> Josh Miner was the first person to bring Albert Baum to the United States from Great Britain. So what he did is that he taught at a, at a private school actually in Massachusetts, Northern Massachusetts called Andover Academy, and he had a sabbatical. So he went to Gordonston to teach because he heard about this person, Kurt Hahn. We all know who Kurt Hahn is, right? If you're an outward bound junkie, you know who Kurt Hahn is. <laughs> all right. So Kurt Hahn was a developer, kind of one of the developers of outward bound. And Josh Miner went over for a couple of years to Gordonston to work with Kurt Hahn and figure out what this guy was all about. And one of his responsibilities was that he was the track coach, the tr track coach, running around the circle, track coach. And they didn't have a very good track team. In fact, they didn't ever win any track teams. But they were running against some uh, school that, from London that had a lot of kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. And they actually were doing a track meet. And halfway through the track meet, they were actually winning the track meet. This was the first time they were going to actually win a track meet. And Kurt Hahn kind of strolled down from his office and he said, well, Josh, how's the track meet going? And he goes, Kurt, it's going great. We actually might win once on there. And he looked around at the boys from the school from London, and he looked at their feet, and he noticed says, well, you know, the, the lads, the boys from the London school aren't wearing shoes. And he says, well, you, why is that? He says, well, they can't afford track shoes, so they run barefoot rather than in their school shoes on there. And he goes, well, we'll have to start to meet over and have everybody run without shoes. And he goes, well, if we do that, we probably won't win. The main reason why we're winning is we have good shoes on there. He says, you don't understand, Josh. The reason we have track and the reason why we're here at Gordonston is not to make people faster and better runners, but it's to make, through running and track, to make people better people. So this concept of achieving kind of holistic learning, of, not, of using the physical to not only get, have people grow in physical ways, but to have people grow in emotional and social ways is the concept that realistically embodies much of the focus of programming for adventure programming in education and corporate groups and therapeutic groups. If I take someone rock climbing in a therapeutic setting, we're going to go rock climbing, but I realistically don't care whether they become a better rock climber. I really don't care if they remember anything about rock climbing a week later. I'm interested in what they achieve through rock climbing as a medium and why adventure propels them to a more functional lifestyle. That's my interest. If I'm working with a corporation, they're not paying me to work with them to have their corporate executives become better at rock climbing. They may want them to be more healthy, but they, want to, they really want the focus to say, because of our participation in adventure programming, does it affect our ability to work together as a group and heighten our bottom line, the return on our investment? If I'm working with a school group and I'm teaching them rock climbing, and it's not for the recreational pursuit of rock climbing, but it is to achieve higher academic learning, that's the purpose of why I choose rock climbing. Is there something inherent in adventure that helps a student learn better? 
That's the value of the pieces that were there. So that was my big aha moment in this job, is that when I was, even though I was hired as a title as a health educator and a physical educator in Rosemont, Minnesota, I ended up discovering is that that's not really why I'm here. I'm really here to help people be better people in the way that being a better person is defined by them. So back in the mid-70s when I was doing this, once again, that was like a long time ago. Long, long time ago, right? That's a long time ago. Not so long for me. That's what that means, is that that was kind of the first insight. And like Alan Ewert and other people in America started to see there's more to this outward bound adventure programming stuff than just teaching people skills. It's like the Kurt Hahn track story, but that's the type of piece that was there. So I moved, and where did, if, you, if you're a rock climber in the United States, you move either to California, Yosemite, or you move to Colorado, and that's where I go, Colorado, right? That's my grandparents lived in Colorado, so I, was, I grew up kind of in Minnesota and Colorado together. So I worked on my master's, and was actually at uh, University of Northern Colorado was working on my master's the same time Alan Ewer was working on his master's. Yeah. And actually it was like a who's who of outdoor education. It was Claude Cousineau from Canada, Don Mendens, Ed Rayola, who was at Warren Wilson College, Alan Ewer, Chuck Tangway, just all kinds of people coming together to do very interesting things. And I, while well, I was kind of getting my master's degree, I also needed a job to eat just like grad students normally have to do. They have to work to kind of eat at macaroni. In the United States, it's macaroni and cheese. You have, do you have a lot of macaroni and cheese dinner in graduate school? No, I do. Do you? Yeah, mac and cheese. That's, that's what you, in the United States, when you're a graduate student, you don't have any money. So when you don't have any money, you have to buy the cheapest thing. And the cheapest thing is macaroni and cheese. And it comes in a box, and it's about, one box, I would say, would be about, oh, 15, 20 NT. But that's your meal on there. Not anywhere as good as the other good food that I've had in China here. But that's what you have in the United States. So, but I needed to make money. So what I did to make money is that on the weekends is that I was a recreational supervisor for a juvenile delinquent um, transition home. And this would be a house that when youth became good enough to get out of juvenile jail being locked up, they would go to this kind of transition house to live with kind of older adults. And if they successfully did that, then they could be released into kind of the general world. So it's a transition home. I worked there from noon on Friday to noon on Monday. And my job was to kind of oversee house number two. Well, the very first weekend that I was there, on Saturday, one of the young men that was in my house stole a tractor and ran it into the side of a church on there. He wasn't intentionally trying to do that, but he didn't drive a tractor very well on there. And the good thing about this type of church and this religion is that the people attended church on Sunday, not Saturday, so no one was hurt. If he would have driven it in on Sunday, that would have been a problem, more of a problem. So he got in trouble, he got arrested, got sent back to jail. And then on Sunday, really is a very, very warm place in the summer, about 40 C for temperature, hot, hot, hot. So the, being able to go to the community swimming pool is a very big deal because it's the only place in the town you can cool off. Well, within five minutes of us going to the town swimming pool, my group started a fight with someone, some of the local boys in the town, and we immediately got kicked out and lost our pool privileges for the rest of the summer. So that Monday, I went back and met with my supervisor, and I thought for sure I was going to get fired. And there would be no way I could find my mac and cheese to eat. Okay. But what he said is that he walked in and he goes, don't you do some of that rock climbing, whitewater rafting stuff? And I go, yeah, I do that. I enjoy do that. It doesn't do that for a while. He goes, this is what I want you to do. What I want you to do is that come next Friday afternoon, I want you to load everybody up into the van and I want you to take them out of town and go do that stuff. You gotta bring them back on Sunday, but bring them back. But take them out of town because if they stay in town and we have another weekend like we just had, 
will lose our license to operate and they'll shut our program down. So the first real adventure therapy experience that I ever had as a leader wasn't because this is a valid therapeutic technique. It's because they needed to get these guys out of town before they caused more trouble. Okay. So that was the validation of it. And so we started to go, of course, we started to do the things I knew how to do, or I liked to do. We started to go mountaineering in Colorado Rocky Mountains. We started to go rock climbing. We went whitewater rafting. We went backpacking. We used map and compass. And what I started to notice is that most of these youth that had a lot of what I would call failure identities, they defined themselves by the failures they did, not by the capacity of what they could do as a person. Through these success-oriented experiences, they started to see some of the positive things in their life. And these positive attributes fueled them, and the dysfunctional behaviors they had just went away. So by filling them up with kind of some success-oriented experiences, the negativity in their lives just was removed. I really didn't do anything to talk about the problem. We replaced the problem with something they'd rather be. And Willie Unsel, the famous philosopher, said, in America, there are basically, if you go to any normal high school, and this may also be in Taiwan, I'm not sure, you can tell me if it's not over there, is that basically, students are divided into various cliques or groups. There are the, what's called the jock groups, the athlete groups. There are the rich kids. There are the smart kids. Well, if you're not rich, and you're not strong and fast, and you're not smart, what group are you in? There are two groups left. There are the delinquents, the hoods, that attract attention that way. And then there are the nobodies. The nobodies. No identity. So being an adolescent without an identity is worse, in many ways, than being a delinquent. So the only open enrollment, if you're not smart, you're not fast, you're not rich, is to become defined by what you're not. And too often, that's where kids, and I call these cracker kids, it's not kids that start off to be bad to begin with, but it's kids that basically fall through the cracks of our social society and become identified by what they're not and their failure identity. Transitioning and giving kids the opportunity to see themselves as successful is the first step that I didn't really understand at that time in the 70s. But it's the first step that we started to see in adventure therapy and adventure programming that just naturally happens in adventure experiences. Okay. So, having enough experiences with all these youth, I started to see certain things that were common and happen. I want to just talk to you about this. And some of you are at my presentation at the Asia Association for Experiential Educators, and I want to just share this. But basically, over the past, you know, if I do my addition right, 30, 30 plus years, I started to see that there are certain common elements that happen in adventure programming that make it work well, that propel it forward and make these kids that had failure identities just naturally success oriented and give them the opportunity to be someone they want to be. Using rock climbing to be something other than a rock climber. Using rock climbing to make people better people in their own eyes. Um, so the first thing that I found out that we started to do is one of the reasons why adventure programming works, whether you have it in a therapeutic setting, a corporate setting, or an educational setting, is that the first thing we do is we have an unfamiliar environment. Most of us don't spend our lives going around passing people through spider's webs, or climbing up on large telephone poles and jumping off and grabbing a trapeze bar on a rope course, or going rock climbing and spending our lives on the side of a rock face. You know, we take people to do different experiences than they normally encounter in their lives. And it's because of that unfamiliarity that two things happen. One, because of the disparity in the environment, they're able to define who they are better. They can see themselves separate from their failure identity. And two, it allows them to become something different than they currently are. For most youth, 
if you give a person an opportunity to be better, they're going to take it. All of us have an inherent piece, basically, to be better. The only reason kids put other kids down is to make themselves look better. That's one of the reasons why. And the only reason why kids stay down is that to expose themselves, they'll be put down by other kids. But if we use group dynamics in unfamiliar environments where kids aren't really able to do that and they get a new perspectives, we see changes happen. So this is what I want you to do, just to illustrate this idea. And this is something that I do sometimes for a quick therapy thing with a kid in session. So I want you to put your notes down and I want you to stand up and give yourself a little bit of room. Get up, get up out of your chair. This is where you stand up and get up.